My name's Ricky, and I was a patient here at Kindred. I started having really massive hemoptysis, and I was throwing up about a trash can full and a toilet bowl full. Uh, so I figured something's wrong. And um, I thought I was gonna you know, pass out, but like I didn't want my wife to find me, or especially my kids or anything. So I just kind of reached down my throat and started pulling out clots. And luckily, I pulled out enough to where it popped and I had air. And then uh, I was helicopter flighted from Lafayette, Louisiana to Houston, Texas. Ricky's a really interesting story and something that we probably don't see that often even in lung transplant, but uh, Ricky has cystic fibrosis. It's a disease he was born with that he's had his whole life. Ever since I was young, I kind of used comedy possibly as a defense mechanism. My very first joke I ever told my mom kind of gave me because I guess she was joking, but I took it as a joke. But um, I asked my mom when you found out, um, you know, when you found out I had CF, you know, what do you think? She said, well, we were upset and the doctor told us that you wouldn't live past the age of 13. And when you turned 14, we were pissed. <laughs> when they told me, gave me a timeline, I didn't get angry or upset. I just said, well, that's your opinion, you know. Um, and I didn't like set out to prove them wrong. I just knew that I wasn't going to die that early. And so a big thing though was um, ever since I, was, I can remember when I was young, I always did my treatments and did what I had to do. I was very compliant. You know, even though people with cystic fibrosis do better and better uh, compared to what they did, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, Ricky always knew that he was going to get a lung transplant. So after he'd been in the hospital several times, we decided it was better to, to keep him in the hospital for a prolonged period of time. And so that's when he came over to Kindred. And it worked out well for us as it often does because we're able to work on getting him stronger, getting him walking more uh, while working on his treatments for his uh, cystic fibrosis exacerbation. And um, the advantage of that was that, you know, we got him stronger while waiting for the transplant. Ricky was one of my favorite patients. He was always happy, um, always get go lucky and laughing, making jokes when I'm in the room. So I really enjoyed taking care of him. He's a very positive spirit. Before his transplant, I took care of Ricky as far as um, his IV medications, anything that he needed just to sustain him, keeping him infection free, and keep him up with uh, physical therapy. Kindred benefited me. Uh, in keeping me mentally and physically on the right track. A lot of our patients are sent here pre mainly to get nutrition and condition because studies have shown that people who go in there healthier actually come out and do better. Nurse Tiffany and Nurse Renee, I mean all the nurses that I had at least were very personable. They kind of got your mind off of what you're here for um, and I know I was here for like six weeks waiting, but it didn't seem that long. The really interesting part, I guess, of Ricky's story is that he actually had a really, really large episode of, of coughing up blood the day before his transplant. It was April 16th, fifth floor of Kindred, five, room 512. Being a year with hemoptysis, at this point, I kind of know when it's coming on. He was coughing up so much blood that he was actually dying. If it, something like that had happened, you know, when he wasn't in the hospital, he may not have lived through the episode. We was able to get an emergent transfer. At that time, um, I had to accompany him in the ambulance because he was essentially unstable. The first thing she told me was, I have to intubate you. And with a CF patient, that, that isn't great. And I said, no, you know, I'm a, I, I don't want to be intubated. Um, I don't want my family to see me like that. I don't want my friends to see me like that. I'm, I'm fine with whatever happens. And then she pulls out the big guns. She says, uh, you know the pictures of those two little boys upstairs? And I was like, oh, fine. Uh, yeah, you got me, okay. So I said, can you just do me one favor before you intubate me? She said, what's that? I said, can you just pray with me? So I put my head on her shoulders and started praying and that's the last I remember. We had to put him on a breathing machine, we had to take him back to the hospital, and then actually right after that, he got his organ offer for transplant. And so that's actually a, a very interesting story in that that 
seldom happens. So he was already in the hospital. He got his offer for transplant. We did his transplant the next day, and he actually did very well after that. Everybody kind of got to tell me for the first time that I had lungs, because I would forget. And then, uh, you know, the last time they all told me together, and I was like, you know, I just was surprised. I was like, what? No. They made a big celebration when we walked over there to see him. He felt that without us, he wouldn't be alive today to see his two kids. And um, his, his wife hugged us. The family came over and was like, thank you. Thank you for saving my child. He had an amazing recovery. He actually went home within about 14 days. Being home with my wife and boys is it's awesome. It's like a new life, you know, a new start, like a second chance. You know, some, you know, a lot of people you hear that you only have one life. You know, you know, well, some people, like myself, get a second chance. You know, I have two, and so I just can't take it for granted that I have a second chance at doing whatever else I want to do. Being a dad, so there's that hope now that that truth behind I'm um, see them grow up.